Great. Well, hello, everybody, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, right now, we are here with Mona Chalabi, and I'm so excited to be able to talk with you a little bit more. And I'd also like to have you introduce yourself to some people, because I know that you do some amazing artistry and, and, and data journalism, but I think you can probably describe yourself better than I can. I mean, I think that's it. I'm a data journalist and artist. You nailed it. Nothing more to say. Perfect. We're done here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for, for real, it's, I, I love your work. I've, I've been stalking you on Twitter ever since I discovered who you are. And it, it's, it's so impressive, some of the stuff that you've done. And I saw that Fortune recently named you uh, 40 Under 40. That's amazing. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, so you've built a career unearthing and illustrating neglected data, and your work is, is just incredible. What led you to become a data editor and, and uh, the phrase to take the numb out of the numbers? Um, so after my degree, I went to work as part of um, an organization that is part of the United Nations, right? So I was doing something called monitoring and evaluation work um, where we were looking at statistics of vulnerable populations and then trying to produce reports about them. And basically, I just felt like a lot of the work that existed wasn't particularly good. It was only reaching a really, really small audience. So journalism felt like a really natural environment to go into because obviously having a large audience is quite inherent to journalism. At least it's an aspiration of many journalists. Um, and yeah, the data visualization stuff just naturally came as part of that. Yeah. That is so awesome. And, and how do you choose which stories you want to tell with with the data that you are unearthing and, and, and sharing with the world? Um, I think very often, I, um, I would say the stories fall into two categories. One are the ones where they're part of existing conversations that are happening. So this thing is in the news, everyone's talking about it, but they're not really understanding one aspect of it. So I think very often stories can have more impact when there's an existing conversation taking place. Um, to give one example, I saw the recent news about a ban, I forget which state it was in, was it Iowa? On um, hormone medicine for trans kids. I um, don't know if that was Iowa or Alabama. Uh, Alabama. Anyway. Alabama was Alabama it sounds like it would make sense based on the state's history on um, access to abortion. Anyway, um, so in a case like that, I would be thinking about data on how many trans kids are going to be affected by this. And also, what is the history of that medication, right? How long has it been safely prescribed for? Has it been safely prescribed to cis kids, which has often been the case, without any kind of public debate? For example, cis kids who engage in sports activities where they request that kind of medication. And again, no kind of public outcry. So that, for me, seems like a natural place to find that data. And then the other place I come up with stories is honestly just my inbox. People write to me saying, you know, I'm a public teacher in, I don't know, Des Moines, and here's something that came up in my classroom, and can you take a look at it? And I find those to be really, really important sources of ideas because obviously, you know, I don't think data is perfectly neutral and objective, and my understanding of stories is shaped by my experience and who I am. So it's really important I have the opportunity to hear these other voices from other people that are saying, this is the data that matters to me. Can you find a way to bring it to life? That's so cool. And, and how many of those stories would you say come from your inbox and stuff? I, I imagine you get a lot of those kinds of emails. Yeah. Honestly, I think like 50% of them. Um, wow. And very often it will also be in my inbox that people will respond to an existing piece of work that I've done. And that then inspires another line of questioning. So it's given an example. Um, today, I published a piece on The Guardian about um, firearms in the US. Again, another huge, huge subject, right? So yeah. again, seeing a few very high profile, unfortunately, um, mass shootings in the US using assault weapons, which again inspires this public debate yet again about banning assault weapons. And what the article was looking at was the way that actually Banning assault weapons, I mean, as important as it is, really only just scratches the surface because we know that 
things have an incredibly long lifespan. We know there's 15 to 20 million of them already in circulation. And if those weapons can last for 100 years or more, you know, a ban really is only just the beginning. So anyway, I published this piece. And this morning I woke up to um, an email in my inbox from a reader saying, why is no one talking about ammunition bans? And whatever, I literally just glanced at that email before jumping on with you. But I'm just like, wow, that's a really interesting thought. Let me look into that. Are there any case studies in different countries that have tried ammunition bans? Um, is it effective? What is the cost of doing bans like that? Um, people just have really fantastic ideas that aren't necessarily going to occur to me. It's great. Yeah, that's that's a really good use case of it. And so because this gun bans and the abortion thing, it, those are controversial topics. Mm -hmm. so one might argue they shouldn't be, but but they are. Do you get negative responses from it? Or rather, is, is that something that you're ever bombarded with? Does it is it ever just discouraging or is it something that it's kind of comes with the territory? The only thing I get discouraged by, I wouldn't even say discouraged. The only thing that ever concerns me are questions or comments about the accuracy of my information. It's all that I'm striving for. Um, anything else, like, you know, um, if someone wants to leave a comment saying trans kids don't have the right to access that medication, someone's more than welcome to leave that comment. Uh, I don't really care. It has no impact on me whatsoever. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, actually, I would say sometimes I kind of wish they didn't leave that comment in case it alienates other people who are reading on that post. But besides that, the, the comments that really, really like keep me awake at night will be, you know, I actually initially misunderstood this because I read the wrong axis. And then I'm like thinking, mm -hmm. oh God, how can I improve design to make sure that no one miss comes with one set of ideas and leaves with a different set of information than what is actually accurate. Yeah, those are the things that I worry about. Yeah, well, I, I can imagine. And so what do you do to ensure that the data is sound? And, and like, what's your process for, for doing that kind of research? I mean, honestly, I think in some respects it might be similar to your work and similar to a lot of the people who are watching right now. It's user testing. It's just, it's not yeah. very, it's not really what's done in journalism, right? You don't just publish a piece to like a small handful of people and make sure that they understand it. So instead, I try to kind of replicate that just using SMS technology. So I'll like <laughs> have a group chat or a WhatsApp group with, I don't know, anywhere between three and 10 people that are friends, family, and I'll just send them an illustration and say, does this make sense to you? Or I'll send them two or three versions of an illustration and ask them which one is the clearest. And it's not great, right? Because obviously the people who are in my network might have certain things in common. Um, right, certain bias. Yeah, certain biases. Most of my friends have a similar political inclination to me. Most of them, the vast, vast majority of women, you know, how do those things mean that they might also interpret information in similar patterns to what I do? Um, but it's what I have for now, and I'm still always trying to think about ways to systematize that with a much broader group of people. Yeah. And so how, what kinds of systems have you thought about outside of the, the group chats and stuff? <sighs> It's really difficult, right? What, what I've honestly thought about is almost having like a, a user group that I would pay on like a monthly basis. To mm. work. And in journalism, generally, it's considered a huge no-no to pay anyone for their time. Um, Interesting. It would, which I think is totally legitimate. It's, it's a concern that if you paid a source, for example, to tell you, you know, this is what they think about this new government policy, whatever, you could be... Um, it could encourage them to, to say one thing or another. The mere right, or what you want to hear. Yeah. yeah. But I feel like it's actually really, really problematic that a lot of the time, journalists are either speaking to the exact same group of experts that are very often like, you know, academic professors, um, don't know, legal experts, whatever, or they're speaking to people from quite, um, I want to say underprivileged, but I always think that word kind of doesn't make sense. Honestly, so like quite poor people who don't have much access to resources and just saying, hey, can you chat to me for an hour? I'm sorry, I can't give you anything for that. And that also yeah. fits really comfortably with me. So I think for me, in this one particular scenario of showing people data visualizations and saying to them, please don't be afraid to tell me if you don't understand this. It doesn't make you stupid. It means that I've messed up. 
I don't feel any qualms with paying people for that. I just need to figure out what does it mean to have a representative demographic pool for that? How can I make sure that that group rotates? I'm not asking too much of them. Those are the things I'm kind of grappling with at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really interesting problem to solve. Like it's kind of getting my engineer brain turning like, ooh, I wonder if we could make an app for this. Because <laughs> because that, that's a real problem that I think, yeah, it's it's not just something that journalists deal with. It is something that like teams deal with where yeah. user testing, you don't want to just get a certain group of people yeah. looking at something that you're building or something like that. And, and uh, there's only so many people in the world who would want to be continually asked does this make sense? I mean, even my friends are getting sick of me, and they <laughs> like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I do. Journalists ever help other journalists with it? Like, I wonder if it's if there's like a they do. But I think it's really, really problematic. I mean, part of the reason why I went into these hands-on visualizations was because I found myself in a workplace that was incredibly bro-ish, where the bros would show each other. The data, the incredibly complicated interactives that they built, and they'd be like, "Whoa, like incredible graphics, really, really cool." And I'd just be like, "Yeah, so, English as a second language has no chance of understanding this." But you, because of who you are, it would never even occur to you to make journalism accessible to people who speak English as a second language. Right. And I found it so infuriating, and honestly, journalism is still overwhelmingly white and middle class. So yeah. I don't really think that reaching out to my peers is going to get me to that point of creating information that is as accessible as possible to the largest group of people that I can possibly reach. That makes a lot of sense. And so when you when you do face those kinds of complex subjects that you do want to make accessible, do you ever hit just create a block on, on how to do that? Uh, do you do you ever have to figure out how you'll how you'll do this and get stuck? Yeah, I mean I definitely reach those creative blocks, but I think. The thing that's nice about data visualization is it's super structured, right? So for me, very often, the creative block comes at the creative bit. So it's like, I'm, let's say I'm trying to create an illustration about domestic violence rates in the US. For me, it's really difficult to come up with a visual language that is both compelling and easily understandable um, and graphic without being upsetting when it comes to difficult subjects like police shootings, domestic violence, you know, anything that could honestly be triggering to someone. And I mean that in a true PTSD sense of the word. Um, and the, the thing that's kind of helpful in some respects when it comes to data visualization is if I hit those blocks, I'm just going to go for quite a classic data visualization that isn't super, you know, creative and graphic because I don't want to cause anyone harm. I just really, really want to disseminate this information. So that can be the hardest bit, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I actually, I read an article somewhat recently that that's kind of how the anime genre actually came to be <laughs> because they, they wanted to illustrate what happened in wars past and stuff, but it was too graphic to be able to, to oh, wow. use people and do live action and stuff. And so it's anime began to illustrate those kinds of concepts with cartoons. So that way it was more swallowable for audiences. That's so interesting. Isn't it so interesting? And now it's now it's a whole genre in itself, but that, that was the origin piece for it. But see, that's also interesting to me about whether, I think our brains do really, really interesting things. And sometimes when something is abstract, and I'm not talking about abstract in the sense of like a simple bar chart, although I think that's the ultimate abstraction, but let's say right. anime is more abstract than, than video documentary. Our imaginations can do strange things to fill in the gaps. That's true. And that's I wonder very if true. Kind of that act of imagining can be even worse in some ways because you could imagine the face of a loved one on a cartoon more than mm -hmm. Actual video footage, you know clearly that isn't the face of a loved one. But maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I think people's brains think in very different ways. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it, though. I I hadn't thought of it that way. Oh man, <laughs> I could dive into that deep. Um, so speaking of 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 making all these visualizations and stuff, how do you? Is it is it something that you sketch on paper first and then and then use another tool? What what type of tools and technologies do you use to do it? So the very first thing I do is just like look at the data set itself and try to see what's happening in the data set. Um, very often my questions are, you know, who is affected by this thing? Um, how has this thing changed over time? How does it vary depending on where you live in the country? Kind of like 
really simple journalistic questions. And then actually I use really conventional methods of data visualization. I'll look at, I'll generate a map or a line chart or a bar chart. And then I think about ways to make it visually tied to the subject matter. So if I'm creating a chart, I'm creating a chart at the moment about glacier thinning over time. How can I make the chart itself not just be a simple line chart, but when you look at it, you feel connected to the subject matter. Right. But what I'll then do is I'll create these hand-drawn visualizations, literally just using ink and paper. I scan them and then I resize them in Photoshop so that they are as to scale, as precise as any computer generated graphic. And uh -huh. I think people don't necessarily realize that when they're looking at my work, that it is actually super precise, but it intentionally doesn't look like it because very often I think computer generated graphics overstate the degree of accuracy. So they give this impression of like, you know, the temperature tomorrow is going to be 22.3 degrees when we know it's going to be somewhere between 20 and 23. And when you have a hand-drawn line, you feel that imprecision. You feel inherently like, okay, it's a sense of a range. It's somewhere between here and here. And that is the truth about data. That's the truth about the way that we understand the world. There is a high degree of uncertainty. When you can capture that and show that to people in a way that's still valuable, there's still uncertainty about the efficacy of these vaccines. That's okay. There's no uncertainty about the question of whether or not they are effective and better than nothing. We, have, we can bound our uncertainty, you know. We can say it's somewhere between here and here. And I think that saying it's somewhere between here and here is better than saying it's here. And I think that journalists have a temptation sometimes to say it's exactly here in order to build trust. Um, but I think ultimately that just enhances people's skepticism because they just feel like, how can you possibly tell me that fact with a decimal place? There's no way you can know the truth to decimal places. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. It's almost like a debate between trust and connection, too, because I feel like when you when you do that handwritten stuff, it, it, it feels more human and real like i can i can understand it better because it's it's a person that's telling me this rather yeah. than a computer that generated it and that human aspect is again intentional right because someone right. does create those computer generated graphics someone does create the algorithm someone does build the data set but all of that seems to kind of get washed away by the time you're looking at a clean like abstract bar chart and what i want to do is be honest about that human element and when you look at a hand-drawn right. illustration it's impossible to forget that a person drew it. There's no way that a computer could come up with that. And again, I think that feels more, it feels more honest in some ways, because in some ways I'm actually being super upfront about the fact that I am a subjective journalist. I do believe trans kids should have access to medication, and here's why. And I'm kind of apologetic yeah. about the fact that I have an opinion about the data that I'm showing you. Yeah, that is that is so interesting. And so that's interesting that you do it on paper and then scan it in. Have you ever tried the tablet approach or, or anything? I just it? Have it, and I just don't love it. Like I've tried it quite a few times and I still use it for like, I use it for texture, I use it for shading. Um, but it's amazing, even now, there are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of um, pen strokes you can use on the tablet to simulate different forms of ink. And none of them are like as good as just drawing something and scanning it. It's amazing, yeah. I agree. Yeah, I've I've tried drawing my own diagrams, which are not even half as beautiful as yours. And it's almost like because I have access to the undo button, I keep trying to yeah. make it just perfect and stuff. And then yeah. it, it kind of loses what I wanted to do with hand drawing in the first place. And it's also just, I mean, it's no wonder that podcasts have become absolutely huge. Time away from our screens is really good for our mental health. And for me, yeah. it's like literally one of the only times during my waking hours, other than cleaning, that I'm not looking at a screen. Yeah. Do you draw for fun ever, not just the, the data side of things? I wish I did. You know, I do it very, very rarely because I'm so focused on productivity. Right. You know, I even like my form of physical exercise is to clean because I'm killing two birds with one stone. I'm really bad at <laughs> for the sake of doing it you know yeah same I, I, I love the idea i love the idea of just like reading for fun drawing for fun yeah. doing all these things but now i'm like i could be reading and learn something that i can apply to work yeah. and, and stuff like that it's a real thing <laughs> it's capitalism it's just capitalism the idea that everything has to have some kind of value 
Right. Yeah. We've got to fight against the man. <laughs> Okay. Well, that being said, are you are you looking to learn anything new this year, uh, productivity or not? Yeah, I'm always looking to learn new things. Um, I have been scratching the surface of learning R for a while, and I definitely, definitely want to get much better at that. Um, and talking about skills that aren't necessarily about work and my career and things that are just for me, um, yeah. and teaching myself how to do electrics plumbing vehicle repair i really want to cool. learn things so that um to be frank they're, they're professions that are incredibly male dominated and i don't like the feeling of relying on a man to come into my personal space and quote me any price he likes to fix something when mm -hmm. i learn those skills i mean potentially electrocute myself in the process but also <laughs> I'm, I'm renovating a house right now and i i feel that so hard because there, there's little things where a contractor quoted me like three thousand dollars to get rid of carpet and i watched a youtube video and i did it myself and i'm proud of it yeah it yeah. is yeah. to do it yeah 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 and it's productive and and it, it kind of makes makes you feel like you accomplished something yeah definitely and again it's so much about work i mean one of the things i like about illustration is that you have this physical product which is another reason why i don't really right. like tablets because i get to keep and frame these pieces of paper but so much of a work, including like online journalism, there's nothing to show for it. And so the idea of using a light switch and, and switching on and seeing it come alive is, is exhilarating. Like, yeah. I did that, yeah. <laughs> and, and so in terms of the tech skill side or for learning R, how are you learning it? I, I haven't touched R in, in a few years myself. I know. I actually think I'm like quite a few iterations behind you. I'm learning software that will soon be redundant. But, <laughs> um, I mean, that's the language for data and, and statistics. I think and it's really relevant, but people also love Python, and maybe that's what I should um, really be learning. But um, I'm quite self taught on loads of things. I taught myself Photoshop and Illustrator, and also animation, I've taught myself. Although, again, I need to keep up those skills because I find that if, you know, six months pass and I haven't opened up um, uh, the software, then I've kind of forgotten a ton of it. But um, for oh yeah, there's just so many online tutorials that you can take a look at. And they're again the thing that's really beautiful about so many of these things is if you can do like this initial chunk, very often in quite a structured way, there is such an incredibly generous community around so many of these yeah. things that all you have to do is Google how do I do this? And you'll find 40 responses where just generous people have explained to someone else in really clear and useful language. And it's just mystery solved straight away. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's that's one of my favorite things about tech is is people be being generous with with learning and stuff. And and whether it's in the form of like Stack Overflow answers or or forums and Discord groups and stuff, I I love seeing people give information away to help people learn this kind of stuff. Cause I didn't have that when I was learning how to code. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's really, really amazing. Again, I kind of, I'm always quite fascinated by it. Like, again, the data person being like, wants to understand the demographics of who does that. And if there's like a certain personality type, because I know it sounds really awful. I don't think I'm that person. As much as I want to like create and put out really useful information into the world, I think these are people that are truly generous in the most, like they're not looking for any accolades, any, you know, any recognition. They're just doing yeah. it. They're it's just incredible. helping. Yeah. 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 And it makes it makes the whole industry just so much more accessible for anybody to pick mm -hmm. up anything. Cause because there might be like 20 articles or probably 10 times that to learn are. And you never know who might be learning from which article. There and and there's so much different language and 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 approaches to it. And yeah, I I just I love that. I think that's so cool. I just want to say one thing, since we're talking about accessibility, I think both for my work and even for, for you know all of these blogs and everything that we're talking about, sometimes we can get quite seduced into the idea of like true accessibility on, on the internet and everything is available. And I think so many of us lose sight of the fact that in the US, a lot of people are still without internet access. Yeah. So as I have like repeatedly tried to explain, using data is a developing country. Like, if you shed your ideas of what, what those places are and what it looks like to be in a developing country, America has left behind so many people um, that 
yeah, it's not this perfect platform. And many people in the US still don't have access to reliable, affordable uh, the internet. It's, it's shocking, really. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, and, and a lot of your work is is data accessibility and bringing bringing that data to so many people. Um, unfortunately, not always those with internet, but but it is important in 2021. Data accessibility is is so necessary, especially with all the fake news out there and, and misinformation and everything. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge um, responsibility, and I, I definitely feel like at the start of the pandemic that weighed on me especially heavily. Because, oh, sure. uh, yeah, if, if I put out something that people misinterpret or misunderstand that actually shapes their public health behaviors, I was just like, I was so worried that I would be responsible for making someone unwell. Yeah. And, yeah ultimately, that anxiety and fear is a good thing. It meant that for a while I was just quiet. I was just quiet and ensuring that I was quadruple checking everything I did. And I think that that's a good thing. Yeah, it's a yeah. good thing for people to just be quiet. Yeah, yeah. it is. And uh, I can only imagine how nerve wracking that was, though, because it's, it's a responsibility that I hadn't considered, honestly, for a lot of journalists. Um, so because because there's there's so many people paying attention to data more now than ever in the pandemic and, and everything, how can someone like me, how can technologists in general improve data literacy and, and support that on our team and, and for others? Um, I mean, some of it is what I just mentioned about user testing at the start of the conversation, I think. Don't just make sure that the, that the data makes sense to you and your team. Ask yourselves if it will make sense to people who have learning disabilities, people who speak English as a second language, people who have dyslexia. You know, a bare minimum, for example, I have this plugin on my screen called Color Oracle, and I make sure that any, or well, I try to make sure, sometimes I sometimes I mess up, but I try to make sure on my checklist of things to do that any data visualization I create, I check on Color Oracle and I view that illustration as if I have a color blindness, and it will take you through all of the different Interesting. color blindness. And very often, the, the colors that I've chosen, you can't read them anymore. Um, so I just think, like, don't just assume that because it's in, on the internet, it's kind of accessible. Um, there's a lot more steps to making work truly, truly accessible. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, so okay, we're starting to run out of time. And so yeah. I have one last question for you before before we head off. But so what, in general, what are some ways that data can bring people together in a more inclusive way, in your opinion? I, I actually think that sometimes that opportunity to bring people together happens in the spreadsheet itself. Sometimes when I'm like looking through a, um, a subject like, for instance, let's say access to abortion, right? And, and it will, let's say it has like socioeconomic data about who can get access to an abortion. And you see that people in the lowest economic groups who aren't able to travel to a place to, to be able to access an abortion are the least likely to be able to do it. That to me is actually in some ways a group of people being able to speak as one in a spreadsheet. Um, mm. And that's across a bunch of different subjects. And I find that quite exciting. And like rather than putting your hand up and saying, which I think is really, really important for people to be able to tell their own stories and say, this is what happened to me. If you're able by filling out a questionnaire to speak with 20,000 other people and say, here is a pattern of an abuse of power, here is a pattern of marginalized people not being given access to resources. That's really powerful. You get to speak as one. Um, I kind of think that's data journalism when it's at its best. Yeah. Well, that is a beautiful note to end on. Thank you so much for your time, Mona, today. It was Thank awesome talking to you. Yeah.